Almost 20 years ago, when I first went into this business, Holy Week always began with a very festive Palm Sunday, complete with palms and a procession, as it did this morning. But then it wound its way through Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, with worship services on both days, and in some cases, a Holy Saturday vigil, before we got to the glory of Easter Sunday. Somewhere along the way, those midweek services began to languish and then decline and even disappear in some of our churches. Maybe it's because the pace of life moved into warp speed and our schedules got more and more packed with things that always seem to take priority over church. Or maybe it's because, as some have suggested, the somberness of Maundy Thursday and the sheer brutality of Good Friday We're too much of a downer in a culture that savors a more upbeat religion, as if the everyday assault of violence and brutality can somehow be separated from Sunday. Whatever the reason, it's true that many contemporary Christians go from the parade of Palm Sunday directly to the party of Easter, with nothing much in between. For me, as a child whose family had no connection with the church other than sending my sister and me to Sunday school once in a while, Palm Sunday was significant only because it was a week closer to Easter, which meant a week closer to being able to put on the new Easter dress, a week closer to the arrival of the Easter bunny and an Easter egg hunt at my grandmother's house, a week closer to a major chocolate overdose. As I got older, Easter never quite lived up to my expectations like it did when I was a child. Even though I continued to dye Easter eggs and make Easter baskets and provide everybody with more than enough jelly beans and chocolate bunnies. I always felt kind of let down when it was over, like something else should have happened, like something more should have happened. It was a long time before I realized that what needed to happen for me was right there all the time between the excitement of Palm Sunday and the joy of Easter. What needed to happen for me was to join the Palm Sunday procession and follow it all the way through the sadness of Maundy Thursday and the darkness of Good Friday. What needed to happen was Holy Week, when there is a shift from the palms to the passion. Sadly, we all seem to have drifted back to that, even those of us who grew up spending three hours in church on Good Friday. So the church, in its infinite wisdom, started calling this Palm slash Passion Sunday. See your bulletin. Perhaps in the hope that the people who got here on Palm Sunday would at least have a taste of what was to come when Easter, before Easter morning rolled around. Lectionary resources always suggest that somewhere in the service we turn the corner and move from the celebratory parade into Jerusalem and onto the rough road that leads to Golgotha and the cross. Often a service begins with the passage from Mark that I just read and ends with the full reading of the Passion, or the account of Jesus' betrayal and trial and death. One of my favorite preachers has noted that while he thinks the theology is right on target, the compromise that has been reached is not. He likens most palm slash passion services to the El Camino, the Chevrolet that made its debut in about 1965. Remember that one? If you don't remember it, I'm not surprised. It, it didn't play well. Comfortable sedan up front, rugged pickup in the back. What happened was people who wanted comfort bought sedans, and people who wanted to haul stuff bought pickups. For us in hockey-crazed Minnesota, we could also liken it to the mullet. Party in front, business in back. (laughs) Any way you look at it, it's complicated. But today is the start of Holy Week, a week that will witness great hope as well as profound despair. And it begins for us on Palm Sunday with the story of a procession into the city of Jerusalem. For Jesus and his followers, it was the beginning of Passover. And every faithful Jew who was able would have made the pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. In one of their more recent books entitled The Last Week, well-known theologians Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan remind us that there were two processions that entered the city that day. About Palm Sunday, they write, one was a peasant procession and the other was an imperial procession. 
Because it was Passover, the time when the Jewish people celebrated divine deliverance from the Egyptians while they were at the very same moment living under the oppression of the Roman Empire, riots often erupted. So it was in the best interest of the government to make sure there was enough military presence in the city in the event of trouble. And so for every major Jewish holiday, most particularly Passover, the Roman governor, who in this case was Pontius Pilate, rode up to Jerusalem from the capital city of Caesarea on the coast at the head of an impressive display of cavalry and soldiers and armor and weapons. Arriving from the west, Pilate's procession symbolized Roman imperial power, and it made it very real. Not only did the procession symbolize imperial power, it also symbolized imperial theology, which said that the emperor was not simply the ruler of Rome, he was also the son of God. So right away, Pilate's procession embodied not only a rival social order, but a rival theology as well. From the east, Jesus rode in from the Mount of Olives on the back of a donkey to the cheers of enthusiastic followers and sympathizers who shouted, Hosanna, or save us. Borg and Crossan maintained that Jesus' procession deliberately countered what was happening on the other side of the city. Pilate's procession embodied power, glory, and violence of the empire that ruled the world. Jesus' procession embodied an alternative vision, the reign of God. They write, the contrast is clear. Jesus versus Pilate, the nonviolence of the reign of God versus the violence of empire. Two arrivals, two entrances, two processions, and our Christian Lent is about repentance for being in the wrong one and preparation to abandon it for its alternative. No journey is without difficulty, without bumps in the road and potholes that threaten to bring the whole thing to a grinding halt. And this journey was no exception. Jesus began experiencing bumps in the road and the potholes almost the minute he entered the city. In three of the gospel accounts, you remember he ends the day by turning over the tables of the money changers in the temple. In the gospel of Mark, we read, And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him. And in Luke, every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests and scribes and leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him, but they didn't find anything they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. As the week went on, it seemed that Jesus was confronted at every turn by those who were intent upon entrapping him and discrediting him in the presence of the crowds of people who followed, the people who listened, those who were spellbound by what they heard. The chief priests and scribes and elders stopped him in the temple and questioned him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus turned the tables on them by asking a question of his own that they could not answer. Some Sadducees, who were part of the aristocracy, tried to corner Jesus with a question about resurrection. Since they didn't believe in an afterlife, their sole purpose was to trip him up. And they asked him a complicated question about the practice of what was known as levirate marriage, in which a widow, following the death of her husband, married one of his brothers in order to produce an heir for her husband. Jesus replied with an equally complicated response that began by suggesting that the Sadducees didn't understand scripture and ended with the statement that God is God of the living, not the dead. Not primarily about life after death, but life in this world. And then there was that deep pothole about paying taxes to the emperor. When the Jewish homeland was added to the Roman Empire, Rome imposed an annual tribute on the Jewish people. Basically, the tribute was a per capita tax on all adult Jewish men, but it was padded with taxes on land and agricultural production. The taxation was economically burdensome, to be sure, but it also symbolized the Jewish homeland's lack of sovereignty. It painfully underlined their oppression by the empire. So the question was asked, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? If Jesus answered no, he could be charged with sedition or denying Roman authority and promptly arrested. If he answered yes, he risked having the crowd turn on him because for both economic and religious reasons, they deeply resented Roman rule and taxation. So Jesus asked if anyone had a denarius 
a Roman silver coin that was equal to about a day's wages. And of course it was produced, apparently by one of the questioners. And then he asked, whose head and title is on this coin? We know that the answer was the emperor's. Borgen cross and suggest that the moment the coin was produced, the questioners lost credibility because they were perceived to be part of the politics of collaboration. They write this. In the Jewish homeland in the first century, there were two types of coins. One type, because of the Jewish prohibition of graven images, had no human or animal images. The second type, including Roman coinage, had images. And many Jews would not carry or use coins of the second type. But Jesus' interrogators in the story did. The coin they produced had Caesar's image along with the standard and idolatrous inscription heralding Caesar as divine and the son of God. Then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. For Jesus and many of his Jewish contemporaries, everything belonged to God. What then belonged to Caesar? The implication is nothing. We know how the story ends, of course. The chief priests and scribes and elders wanted Jesus put to death, but they were afraid of arresting him on the eve of Passover because of the threat of riots. But then we turn the corner. Following the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, and early on Friday morning stood before Pilate and was condemned to death by crucifixion, a death sentence that was immediately carried out. Every year, as we stand waving our palms and shouting Hosanna, we are faced with the same question, the same alternative that faced those who lined that bumpy road into Jerusalem. Which procession are we in? Which procession do we want to be in? Perhaps the greater challenge of Palm Sunday is to decide where we're going to be when Jesus is betrayed and denied, when he is brought to trial, and when he is crucified. Hear these words from the Gospel of Mark. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. We agonize over the injustice in the world. We lament systems that treat people unfairly, that perpetuate dishonesty and greed. But will we come in the night with a kiss of betrayal? And again from Mark. Then after a while the bystanders said again to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. And at that moment the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. We are revolted by the inhumane treatment of prisoners. We are offended by the racist and sexist remarks and images that fill our daily consciousness. We are perplexed by a dizzying array of causes and crusades. Will we deny having any knowledge of such evil? Will we deny knowing Jesus? And finally, then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. We are overwhelmed by the violence that surrounds us. We are rarely short of words to describe our fear and loathing for those who commit unspeakable acts of terror and violence. Will we turn away when the nails are driven into his hands? Will we do anything to stop the humiliation and the scorn? Will we stay until the end? The choice is always before us. I invite you to be part of Holy Week this year as we make ourselves make our way to the cross. And then ask yourself, which procession are you in? Which procession do you want to be in? Where will you be when the procession ends? There are no easy answers. But then there are no easy questions. Amen.